Hi, this is Scott Lancer, the Director of Associates for Biblical Research, and I'm here today with my co-host Henry Smith, and we're here to uh, uh, discuss an important topic, an important subject on today's Digging for Truth. Uh, Henry, we're going to be uh, looking into the subject of abortion, and so many people would say, well, you know, what does abortion have to do with archaeology? Right. But we right. find that as we study ancient cultures, the material culture that we uh, uncover in archaeology, we find there are huge parallels and connections with this subject. So we're going to uh, get into that today. Yes. And so it would be good for us to kind of, uh, you know, just talk about the fundamentals of this issue, um, maybe the background theological truths and the issues connected with that. So. Why don't you get us started? Yeah, we're gonna uh, we're gonna talk about you know we're gonna have a two parter here. Uh, you know, it's a tough subject, but as the Church of Jesus Christ, we really need to engage with it and and deal with it and bring the the truth of the gospel to the subject. Uh, the issue of uh, the 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 sanctity of life goes all the way back to the ancient world, and we're gonna see that especially in in part two of our of our series here uh, from the world of archaeology. Uh, laying the foundation theologically, I think, is the most important thing for us as the church, yes. okay? So what does God say, right? We have the scriptures, we have the revelation of God. What does God say about life? Uh, when does it begin? When does God permit us to take life? When, it, when has God given human beings the authority to take life? What are the circumstances? Those are the kind of questions that we, we want to mm -hmm. delve in, mm -hmm. into today. So we're going to begin, I think, here uh, with our first, the foundation foundation, and that's back in, of course, the, the book of Genesis, which lays the foundation for everything yes. uh, in, in the gospel. And here we have God making uh, the first man and first woman. He says, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And then he gives them the cultural mandate to have dominion over the creation, the different kind of animals. And he says that he made them in his own image, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Uh, in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he mm -hmm. created them. So here we have this uniqueness of the human being mm -hmm. being made by the direct power of God uh, granted, Adam and Eve are created fully mature, uh, mm -hmm. but the principle uh, extends to all of humanity because we see this in Genesis 5. Adam yes. had a son. He named him Seth, and he was in his own likeness and image. Yes. So it's yes. imagery mimicking the creative activity of God. Very powerful yes. language, but it gives us a foundation theologically uh, that we can yeah. stand on when we talk about this difficult subject. So these, these scriptures are the underpinning, the, yes. the, the foundation of the whole subject. That's right. And I note that you're going to scriptures yes. versus how you feel about the subject. Right, right. Uh, oftentimes today, of course, this subject, uh, it, it stirs up a lot of emotion. A lot of feelings, yes. Yeah. But we are not, as Christians, we are not building our case just by how we feel about it. Yes. Now, when you know the principles of scripture, it affects how you're going to feel about the subject. Yeah, that's right. You, you can argue it. passionately, but it's got to be with emotion, but it's got to be built on a proper foundation. Mm -hmm. There's a distinction uh, as, as, as opposed to being governed by how we feel about the subject. And then we yes. have a second verse, Scott, you know, uh, mm -hmm. has to do with sinfulness, uh, Psalm 51.5. Yeah. Uh, you know, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, mm -hmm. and in sin my mother conceived me, uh, David says. Uh, the, the idea is here, that from the very, very beginning, the person is sinful. Now, this has to do with the fall of the human race. But yeah. the point is the humanity of David here is expressed in mm -hmm. the humanity. Uh, you can't be sinful unless you're human. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's right. And so, you know, we have that principle uh, embedded there in the scriptures mm -hmm. from David speaking uh, mm -hmm. under the Holy Spirit's inspiration in the psalm. Yes, yes. Well, that's very, very important. It, it, every human being... Uh, ha has a sinful nature. And of course, this is a profound theological truth that yes. we, could, we could spend a whole show on just looking at all that, but that's right. important. But the fact that we, that, that humans are accountable to God for what we do. We're accountable for God for the things yes. we do. And it, it is important. This is a, a critical aspect of the whole discussion connected with the subject of abortion. Yeah, that's all right. right. Well, um, Psalm 139 is, is one of my favorite psalms. Yes. And it's, it's a critical text for this discussion. Yeah, uh, here we have expressed, and anyone who's familiar with the subject who's, who's uh, 
uh, a member of the church, knows the subject, knows from the, the psalmist is, is writing also here that the, the inward parts were formed and God knitted this mm -hmm. person together in, the, in his mother's womb. Mm -hmm. uh, you're fearfully and wonderful, wonderfully made. All this beautiful language, uh, personal you might mm -hmm. call it covenantal language. You might, you might yep. say it's that the yep. relationship between God and this human being being formed. Now now we know from, from science that uh, the, the DNA is part of how God does the knitting. Yes. Okay, yes. so we understand uh, the complexity of what God does. But all of that is superintended by and controlled by God, that mm -hmm. computer programming yes. in the DNA. Yep. So yep. that knitting together, I see that as, as personal language. Mm -hmm. uh, affirmed by the, the beauty of the difference of every single person that's made. Right. We find that in the genetic code. It's really extraordinary. It is extraordinary. Well, let's transition quickly yes. here over to, uh, uh, to Jeremiah, uh, chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, and the three stages of human existence. Uh, yes. Talk about how that connects with this. Yeah, I, this verse is so fascinating. You know, the, the word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah. He says, before I formed you, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you, and I appointed you a prophet to the nations. So you have this sort of three stages of human identity. Mm -hmm. First, in the mind of God. Before Jeremiah's parents conceive him, mm -hmm. God knows him. Then he's conceived in the womb, and God anoints him as a prophet. Mm -hmm. And then, obviously, he's born and then is become, grows up and becomes officially a prophet, right? Mm -hmm. But all of that identity, that continuum of human identity, runs through Jeremiah's life even before he comes into existence. Yes. This, every person who's ever existed mm -hmm. is known in the mind of God. Yes, that's right. And, and so, so, so while in theory they don't exist yet, in God's mind they do. Mm -hmm. And they come into existence mm -hmm. uh, through procreation. It's yes. an extraordinary verse, and yes. it really teaches us so much about this, about the, this subject. Well, we only have about 30 seconds here, Henry, but <laughs> yes. talk, talk quickly about John the Baptist and Jesus. And yeah, you know, you know, we know the story, right? right? Mm -hmm. Elizabeth comes and, uh, and, and hears Mary, and the baby leaps mm -hmm. with joy in her room. This is the Baptist mm -hmm. leaping. Now think about this. Yeah. I think John is about six months con from conception at this point. Mm -hmm. He's leaping for joy. He has joy. He hears. He leaps. He recognizes the voice of Mary, right? He's the first person to recognize the Lord Jesus Christ. Extraordinary thing. It really is. And maybe we can talk a little bit more about some of that, yes. add to it a little bit. Um, the Word of God is extraordinary in laying out these foundational truths connected with the subject of life and this issue of abortion. And we'll be right back and to continue our conversation. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research. Written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint, Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Thank you for joining us again today for Digging for Truth, and I'm here with my co-host, Henry Smith, and we've begun a discussion on the very, very sensitive issue of abortion. And so, uh, Henry, we were talking yes. in the last segment about John the Baptist and about Jesus and the fact that these babies were, while they were alive in the womb, and they are spoken of in the Bible as yes. living persons, not as uh, something else. Yes. That's right. I mean, in the particular case of John the Baptist, we have this very uh, personal language. He leaps for joy. He's, yeah. He hears uh, Mary's voice. He, he recognizes Jesus. So the first person to recognize Jesus is an unborn child. I'm reminded also of uh, Esau, Esau and Jacob wrestling mm -hmm. in the room, to, in the womb, excuse me. Yeah. Two nations yeah. wrestling in, in the womb, the text yes. says. Uh, those are people. Yes. Uh, and uh, the, these scripture verses really draw that out for us. Yep. So we've got a really good foundation from the scriptures we've discussed so far. Right. 
establishing the reality of, of, of life, uh, life in the womb, yes. uh, as well as other principles as well. But we want to transition to uh, our, uh, a different kind of focus here. Uh, because God is the author of human life, uh, and people have been created in His image, uh, and life begins in conception, what are the circumstances, what, what types of circumstances does God allow man to take another person's life? Yeah, it, it's, a, it, it's a great question. It's a, such an important question because it helps us define properly what we would call the pro-life position, yeah. which is distorted in the culture, often in arguments and yes. discussions that we have. And even in the church, there's confusion about this. We have to define what that means. And the way to define it is from the revelation of God. That's, again, the foundation that we yes. have to set. Yep. So the question is, uh, when does God permit the taking of life? We li- this of, with the fall, death happens. And there are circumstances where man takes the life of man. When does God allow that? So mm-hmm. in Genesis 9, we have, after the flood, uh, a declaration by God that he will require a reckoning for murder from the murderer mm-hmm. by the hand of man. Mm-hmm. So here we have this sort of principle of civil government, usually is how it's understood. It's been understood in the history of the church, uh, that there are circumstances where God permits the taking of life uh, for this crime of murder. Mm-hmm. So uh, very specific, and, and, very, and again, this is a covenantal language. This is a universal language, too, because this is the post-flood world. Yeah. This is for all of humanity mm-hmm. in, the, in the aftermath of the flood. So that's a very important... Uh, foundational verse. Yes, yes. For us to understand. Yeah. So there are particular um, there are particular applications of when God allows humans to take other humans' lives. It Let's talk so. about those particular things. Yeah. Yeah. So you know the f- the first two categories typically that we've understood, and this is I think our understanding of it. You know, first we have just war. Yeah. Which uh, we're not going to cover that in in any kind of detail. The question of when uh, is, a, is a war justified? And, you know, mm-hmm. there's different opinions in the history of the church, but the concept is the civil, the civil government, uh, if, if it is a just war, it's the state carrying yes. this out. Yes. The second was capital punishment, which we just covered. Mm-hmm. And we see that over in the New Testament in Romans 13, where Paul commands and directs the church in Rome that they're to be subject to the governing authorities, but that the governing authorities have been given the sword Yes. Interesting language yes. uh, to, to bring judgment upon those who commit wrong. Mm-hmm. And, he, and, he, and, and he says that, that the, the agent of the state is an agent of God's wrath. Isn't that yeah. interesting? Yeah. So this, yeah. isn't, this is an Old Testament law here. This is New Testament mm-hmm. understanding of the function of civil government. And, and a subset of that could be the taking of life under certain circumstances. Yeah. But if we note both of them, as yeah. I wrap up here, both are only under the authority of the state, yes. not the individual. And that's the important thing for us to understand. Yeah. Now, you can debate you know, where it applies. That's debatable inside mm-hmm. that context. But there's no debate. It's the state and not individuals. And in, in another area uh, we could talk about quickly here is self-defense. Yes. It seems to me, you survey the scriptures, the only place where we see a justification for an individual not acting under the authority of the state is uh, in, in defense of themselves. Their life or their family is under threat. Mm-hmm. In, in fact, in the Old Testament law, it's, it's very interesting. In Exodus 22, we have this, this verse where there's a burglar that comes into their tent in the middle of the night. Mm-hmm. And an altercation presumably would occur. And if uh, the person's life was taken, the, the, the defender would not be punished accordingly. Mm-hmm. But if the sun was up, then they could be punished yeah. accordingly. So even then, yeah. even yes. though God is allowing self-defense, he's limiting the circumstances very tightly. And mm-hmm. I think the principle there uh, isn't, isn't so much about light and dark and all that. It's about very narrow circumstance mm-hmm. where an individual can take another person's life who's not acting on behalf of the state. Yes. So, yeah. so even in there in the Old Testament law, we see very a very narrow application. Narrow parameters, but yes. legitimate 
applications. Yeah, I think so. I and think so. Uh, so we have to t treat this very seriously. Yes. And in the history of the church, it has been treated yeah. extremely seriously. Yep. And well, there's many things we could discuss in that whole subject. Yeah, that's right. Um, now, um, God prohibits all other forms of unlawful killing. So let's talk about that. Yeah, that's right. We see in the command uh, from the Ten Commandments, in Exodus 20, 13, thou sh usually we quote it as, thou shalt not kill. Mm -hmm. But it's clear uh, from the context, especially in the overall context of the, of the law, that the idea here is, thou shalt not murder. Yeah. Because the law gives provisions for, in the Israelite covenant community, of, of um, certain circumstances where life can be taken, mm -hmm. self-defense, certain crimes that are committed, capital punishment, that sort of thing. So it's obvious that this is, this is a circumstance that's uh, quite serious. And then uh, in terms of murder, and then mm -hmm. we have in Exodus 21, we have a circumstance where two men get into a fist fight or a fight and a woman gets hit who's pregnant and the baby dies. Yeah. The men who cause the altercation, they lose their life. Even mm -hmm. though it's just an accident, Right. Nonetheless, they get into a fight. Their life is forfeit because the child they has killed been killed. the baby. He killed yes. the baby. Yeah. This means the person is human that's in the womb. Very that's important right. principle. Yeah, and I think uh, for our audience today, uh, it's important to grasp these Old Testament accounts because they they bring clarity to how God views uh, a child in the womb. And that's so important yes. as we move into other New Testament passages as well. Well, we will be right back with more discussion on this important subject. We're so glad you joined us. We'll be right back. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Welcome back to Digging for Truth, and I'm having a fascinating conversation today, an important conversation with my co-host, Henry Smith, and Henry and I are talking about the subject of abortion. Very sensitive subject, but very important, and we've been focused on some of the, well, we've looked at the biblical principles, Old Testament, uh, I, I call that the, the structure, the underlying structure of the whole, the whole argument. Right. When we talk about being pro-life, we're talking about understanding what God has said throughout the scripture, uh, as it says in the New Testament, the whole counsel of God. Yes, and yes. on this subject, we need to bring in all of those discussions. We talked about the Old Testament scriptures. We talked about when is it uh, legitimate to take life. Uh, we talked about unlawful killing. And of course, the killing of, of a baby is, is, is uh, unlawful. It, can be murder. That's right. Uh, and it's a serious issue. So life in the womb is to be seen as life. There's a child in the yes. womb. So we want to talk, Henry, transition here a little bit towards this discussion of how the church and Judaism historically has considered abortion. Let's let's jump into that. Yeah, a lot a lot of people may not be aware in the audience that 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 although not as obviously as common as today because of medical advancement that abortion was something that people did in the ancient world too. It was actually mm -hmm. very risky and very dangerous because they didn't have the technology mm -hmm. uh, associated with it. But here's just a couple of reflections I think that are, that are helpful. First, we have the Jewish historian uh, Josephus. And I was thinking about this as I was driving into the studio today. Now, Josephus wrote the Jewish wars, right? So he, he, he had observed the horror of war, mm -hmm. the terror of what the Romans had did done to Jerusalem and to the Jews. So he, he had witnessed these things firsthand, and he was very familiar with what, what had happened, and he was captured by them, and, and so forth and so on. But in talking about abortion, this is, so, this is so interesting, he says this, talking about the law of Moses, it forbids women to cause abortion of what is begotten, or to kill it afterwards. 
-hmm. So he's distinguishing between in the womb and out of the womb. Mm -hmm. Both are forbidden by the law. And if any woman appear to have done so, she'll be a murderer of her own child. That's powerful language. Yeah. By killing a living creature and diminishing humankind. So here we have this, this acknowledgement of that continuum of human identity in the womb, outside the womb. Josephus mm -hmm. recognizes both in the Mosaic Law. Very mm -hmm. powerful statement. And then later, in the, it, well, actually around the same time, mm -hmm. interesting, mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning of the church, there was this document written called the Didache. Uh, few uh, churches in the, uh, in the history of the church thought it was Scripture, yes. but it turns out to be just a reflection on Scripture. Mm -hmm. And it's mainly a, a piece that's written about ethical living. How, how should we live? Yeah, a summary of ethical living. Yeah, for, yep. for the church. Yep. And uh, it's talking about the, uh, you, shall, you shall not murder, mm -hmm. you shall not commit adultery, you shall not corrupt children or fornicate or steal. And then it says this, you shall not murder a child, whether by abortion or by killing it once it is born. Mm -hmm. Again, here's a recognition in the very early history of the church, this is around 90 A.D., of the distinction uh, the two phases of human identity, and both are human. Mm -hmm. uh, and they didn't have the medical technology. They just knew, both by conscience and by the Word of God, yes. that this was a person, and it w this person was not to have their life taken unjustly. Right, right. So the Scripture is clear. Male and female, human beings, yes. are human beings. The baby in the womb is an individual human being. All are to be protected. Yes. None are to have their lives snuffed out. That's right. It is, it is an essential truth to what the Bible teaches. And to add to that, we, we can say now from, some, from science, supports completely what the Bible said, has said for thousands of years. Yes. There's, a dis, there's a difference, a distinct identity of the DNA of the individual child in the womb. This has been proven through, mm -hmm. through science. We've seen this. This is a unique, separate individual who has an individual identity as the text says, mm -hmm. uh, made in the image of God. Right, right. So the, uh, just very quickly, so the, the overarching teaching in the New Testament is that abortion falls under the sin of murder it when does. it's intentional. It does. It's not, it's not just the uh, Old Testament law. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a moral principle embedded in creation, really, yeah. that extends from Genesis all the way through to now. And until Jesus returns for, to create a new world, yes. uh, it's binding on, on humanity. So it's a very serious crime against the child, uh, against the woman, and against God. Yes. And we have to deal with it that way. Yeah, it's a very, very serious matter. Let, let's talk just briefly yes. as we, we wrap up today about the this deceptive language that's often used about this the subject of abortion. Yeah, uh, it's it's very unfortunate, and we have to have our eyes of discernment wide open on this uh, with sensitivity, and and wisdom. We must we must approach this. But you know, there's euphemisms that are used: mm -hmm. health care, reproductive rights, women's rights. These are all terms, to be very frank, that are used to uh, distort and to take attention away from mm -hmm. what the practice actually is. Yes. Um, this person with this distinct identity is being killed. Mm -hmm. And these other terms are being used to distract us from what the practice actually is. Yes. And it's, 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 it's gruesome. Yes. And it's, it's, it's a horrible, uh, the, the child feels pain. Um, uh, there's a lot there that we have to grapple with as, as the church. Yeah. And we yeah. have to hear this language that's being used culturally yeah. and see through it yes. with gentleness and respect, but also with passion and truth. And I yeah. think that's the balance that we have to try to have. Yeah. With it. Well, of course, in, in, right in these days, the new Gosnell movie is, has been released. Yes. And that deals with some of that, the, the horror of all that. Very quickly, Henry, how about... Uh, John Calvin, how did we, he weigh in on this? Well, we know Calvin was a theologian of the 16th century in Europe, you know, uh, start, it was part of the Reformation. And he says this, For the fetus, though enclosed in the womb of its mother, is already a human being. Mm -hmm. And it is a monstrous crime to rob it of the life which it has not yet begun to enjoy. If it seems more horrible to kill a man in his own house than in a field, because a man's house is his place of his most secure refuge, it ought to surely be more deemed more atrocious 
to destroy a fetus in the womb before it has come to light. And that's in his commentary on Exodus. Yeah, yeah, that's a powerful statement. And that's a, an excellent way for us to close uh, uh, this episode of Digging for Truth. This subject is a sensitive subject. We, we pray for those who have, who have been victimized by it, for those who are dealing with the pain of abortion. But we want to establish clearly that God has spoken absolutely clear principles to do with this subject. Well, we're going to continue in the next episode discussing this subject of abortion. Thank you for joining us today.